and uh, on behalf of uh, organizing team i welcome you all along with me i am the uh, course in charge of uh, this program and along with me uh, we have two moderators one dr arti divan from uh, she is faculty from the uh, guru ramdas institute of medical sciences amritsar and we have another eminent faculty from ipgmer calcutta dr arnab so they will moderate the session and uh, uh, we have uh, the speakers and along with uh, not only the speakers but we have eminent faculties apart from the speaker they can also guide us they can also suggest so uh, without wasting time i think let us start the session and the first speaker for this session is professor manish khanna from lucknow uh, sir needs no introduction he is uh and uh, eminent speaker and he has lot of work on uh, 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 on the ortho rheumatology he is you can say the uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, key person as far as ortho rheumatology is concerned so i request professor manish khanna to oh. start his deliberation his Do talk dr. is dr keskar dr so dr please the question will be the president our president of iow sir right. you will sir uh, have some oh sorry sorry the inaugural sorry 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 sorry, sorry. So, 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 uh, so so i beg pardon so i request our president sir professor uh, ramesh sen sir uh, uh, i invite him for welcome speech sir thank you dr peshka so good evening friends definitely uh, this is that uh, is a program from our spine subcommittee and definitely we wish that we sh should be talking about a problem which affects a sizable percentage of our population especially when it is linked not with the spine only when it's associated with a lot many symptoms out of spine also and when we have got this kind of inflammatory pathologies in the spine the kind of a symptomatology the patient they present are likely to be numerous and obviously a uh, detailed discussions and I, if you see the topics today we have got lot many things to be there in the program and i feel all of them are very important and as we have very eminent faculty also which has been uh, there to teach us to talk about all spinal issues i think this is like to be a very useful program so all my best wishes to uh, for this program also and uh, i definitely think that the participants will be benefited a lot and we definitely hope they will have a lot of interaction also with the faculty all my best wishes thank you thank you sir thank you for the kind words and uh, now i request the dr keskar dr keskar uh, I am tempted to say a few words. Please permit me to do that. I, yes, sir. Okay. So I would like to say that this is an extension program almost to a program started by Indian Orthopedic Association in 2019, and IOA under the leadership of then President Dr. Rajesh Malhotra. thought that spondyloarthritis patients more in number as compared to rheumatoid arthritis or even comparable numbers report to orthopedic opds and so he said let us physically that was pre corona era so he had thought of physically training all the basic orthopedic surgeons and so a team of 11 consultants who were called master trainers were trained systematically and slide decks were prepared i am very happy that many of them are present here dr dhansekhar raza is there dr ravi gupta is there dr uh, uh, from uh, madurai dr A, a, a raja mani is there and uh, dr amarnath is there and uh, oh, uh, dr mani said all have joined later so with these words train the master trainers uh, i wanted to inform everybody now back to dr keskar so thank you sir for nice information 
And uh, before we move on, uh, let me invite uh, Dr. Naresh Babu, the chairman of the Spine Society, uh, Spine Subcommittee of IOA, uh, to face to say a few words uh, before we start the academic program. Thank you very much, sir. At the outset, uh, I'm very thankful to Ramdala Society of India for taking uh, initiative and chipping the spine inside the program. And uh, heartfully thanks uh, to Professor Ramesh Sain, sir, for joining uh, in his busy schedule to wish us to start our series of uh, webinars on this uh, particular topic. Uh, and I thank other members of uh, our spine committee, especially Dr. Partha, who took a lot of pains to uh, integrate both the societies uh, to come out with a very good program. I hope the deliberations will be very useful to all the uh, participants and I wish uh, the program very success. Thank you very much, sir. Over to you. Thank you, sir. So, so uh, yeah, I'll please allow me to share the screen. Well, good evening. Namaskar to everyone. Uh, approaching spine ortho rheumatology. So definitely, as it was very exciting to have a comments from legends here. Uh, orthopedics was uh, a trauma orthopedics decade, decade back with a conservative treatment, moving to the surgical treatment. Now, for the last two decades, we are into a lot of those important aspects of orthopedics, joint replacement, arthroscopy, all those things. And a spine orthopedics, a spine subspeciality, when the orthopedic surgeons are overemphasizing and doing a lot of wonderful work to the spine. Definitely spine means trauma and all those things. But definitely, yes, spine orthorheumatology is a big issue which is now being focused for the last two, three years with the help with the, with the umbrella of orthopedic rheumatology because we deal a lot of spine spondyloarthropathies and uh, you know even if even if the spondylo uh, is there sometimes it may be having a component of spondyloarthropathies so it is not only the surgical but now orthopedic surgeons are emphasizing on the medical needs because once you are very much comfortable with the medical requirement of the patient then definitely the results will be far much better along with the rehabilitation part which is the most important thing which we miss sometimes, but has been emphasized in the Western part of the globe. This is very important. So we all know for this topic that arthritis involving the axial spine is spondyloarthropathy. Now, why the complete knowledge of spine, uh, spine orthorheumatology concerning to the spondyloarthropathy is important? Because definitely, yes, the OPDs are having a lot of uh, patients with the arthritis and these seronegative arthritis patients they complain about the spine problem. Now here, if we can click over it and catch over these patients, and the, not only this, a lot of the issues with the degenerative, look, degenerative osteoarthritis is not only a thing which is restricted to the knee, sometimes to the hip, it is there in the spine also. The gout have a wonderful presentation, hyperuricemia have a wonderful presentation to the spine. So there are a lot of entities which we miss in OPDs all while treating the patient surgically. Yes, it is very much true that spondyloarthropathies are the second to the rheumatoid arthritis. That means one to two percent in the globe, the billion population in India are having a rheumatoid. So 0.5 percent, less than 0.5 percent is a big, big chunk of the patient. These patients comes to the OPD with a low backache and we describe, okay, low backache, go, go. No, it's not like that. We need to work out these patients to find out to extract which are the right patient for the spondyloarthropathy. So one to 2% of low backache in OPD may be having the SPA, spondyloarthropathy. This one to two is a big chunk, is a big chunk of the patient which needs to be diagnosed properly, treated properly, and definitely whenever the surgical intervention is required. Now this textbook, Orthopedic Rheumatology, which is very well available in the country, is the textbook which we are focusing a lot of the spine problems on this. A lot of the chapters are there with the surgical intervention, what are the surgical intervention which is being required. Now, this is a usual presentation in our OPD. We are seeing a lot of trauma patient. We are dealing with the trauma patient. We are doing interlocking or whatever it may be like. And these patients gradually, when they come to the OPD, when their nail has been in, they're about to walk, then they started having 
a pain in the spine. Now, this is also a thing which we forego most of the time that it is maybe a, a misnomer or a spinal anesthesia problem. That's actually, if you take these history, then even in your trauma patient, you'll come across a lot of the patients who are having a lot of episodes with a with a pain of the joint, which may be inflammatory pain, mechanical pain, need not to discuss here because today we are having a lot of discussion, but definitely a good history taking can pick up these symptoms right from the day of the stitch removal or your follow-up of four weeks. And definitely a small history of a morning stiffness, maybe not exactly the bookish picture of more than 30 minutes, a small history of the morning history of a stiffness or, uh, you know, a, a waking up, uh, a waking up pain of the buttock pain, restricted spine mobility. They are the good clue, which can pick it up the inflammatory arthropathy in the spine. So these are the early spine uh, spondyloarthropathic patient and the beauty of orthopedic surgeon should be to pick it up as a early, early stage, not to prolong it because the billion population is increasing and increasing and the cases are increasing like anything. Similarly, again, if you're doing arthroplasty and uh, again, they, we are having all these type of history taking which should be required, for example, has been very well explained and pointed out by, by our president that uh, you know, not only a spondyloarthropathy, even a burning sensation of the spine, which we may, may miss, may be a case of a fibromyalgia. So these are the things which are again to be treated by orthopedic surgeons. It's not a big deal. Only we have to differentiate it in which direction we want to go. And with a lot of, in the country, diagnostic setups and different investigation, a big profile coming to your OPD in front of you, say having HLAB 27 positive, ANA positive, the patient is saying, okay, we are having it this spondyl orthopathy. No, it's not like that. It is a dilemma of the patient. It is a work of the orthopedic surgeon, a spine surgeon to find it out whether it is to be a case because actually 27 is normal, normally positive in a lot of the population. We have to work it out whether enthesitis is there or not there. We'll have a discussion today on this also so that we can pick it up. And there are a lot of beautiful modalities, not always required to go for MRI. Just a good ultrasound pickup can help you out to pick an early case of enthesopathy. So in a nutshell, I would like to say that undifferentiated spondyloarthropathy is the most, most commonest. Please don't try to make it a diagnosis on a letterhead. We can write an undifferentiated spondyloarthropathy and just try to treat it as early as possible. Because if you're not going to do it, we are going to land up in the classical case of syndesmophyte and bamboo spine and this and that. And then the surgical intervention would be really, very difficult. Multidisciplinary approach has been required by orthopedic surgeon, by physiotherapist. Just we should work on the same parameter as the Western culture be and just try to focus these patients with all the angles possible. Thank you so much. Uh, just uh, we want to say that uh, all these uh, latest details are being in the textbook of orthopedic rheumatology, which anybody can have it from the Amazon also. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, your excellent presentation. It's a really an eye opener lecture as far as spondylo arthropathy is concerned. So, so, so as we have decided, we will take questions at the end. So now I invite Professor A. K. Pal. Sir, are you there? Uh, Professor Pal is already there. So, sir, are you? Uh, uh, Please, I, I heard run that uh, my you slides, are traveling, so. which is already recorded. Please run my slides, which is already recorded. Okay. So, so, I, a traveling okay, so I request yeah. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Professor Paul is actually traveling back to Calcutta from Paiguri. So I request Dr. Partha to, to run his to run his slide. Dr. Paul, please mute yes, yourself, yes. sir. Yes. Okay, uh, just to invite the next speaker, I will I just there is a big time. So I will after the end of this speaker, I will uh, make this run on this. Okay. Maskar, sir, please. Okay. Okay, okay. So, shall I send our... to order? Shall I send the file to order? Yes, sir. You can send. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so, so, we will, so we will run that uh, that slide at the end of the...
So let me invite, uh, without wasting time, let me invite uh, the next speaker. And uh, the next speaker is none other than. May I, may I request uh, Dr. Paul, please mute your mic. Dr. Dini, please mute your mic so that it will not be a disturbance for us. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, sir. So now let me uh, invite uh, the next will speaker. Be Dr. And... S.S. Amar Nath, sir, from Bangalore, will speak on angst porn diagnosis. And I have received uh, Professor Paul's video. So whenever we are okay, we can run that. Avandat Sir, please unmute yourself. And uh, you can start your presentation. I can start your presentation now. Okay, yes. okay. Thank, thank you, thank you. I will uh, start to share the screen just a minute. Okay. Uh, Are we all able to see the screen? Yes, sir. Screen is visible, but your PPT is still coming. Yeah, yeah. Screen, screen is visible. Now I think it will be coming on. Yes, yes. Yeah, perfect. Is it on a PPT mode yeah. for you all? Yes, sir. Perfect. 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 And the voice is clear as well. Great. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Arnab. Uh, at the outset, this is me, what I'm doing. And then uh, thank you for uh, being uh, invited faculty for the IOA spine subcommittee and to share a few thoughts. Dr. Manish has made my life very easy and I've, I've hit a lot of my slides now. So there will be some repetitions probably, but yet uh, the speakers will have a bird's eye view of all the things that we are talking about. End of the day, see, we need to understand very, very clearly. How do I need to diagnose? Is there any criteria that I can put on? And also at the same time, how can we pick it up early so that we can avoid the life-threatening deformities that one that we have, many of us have seen and face on a, if not reg daily, on a regular basis in our uh, OT. And many of us have seen the challenges that we go through with that kind of a surgical intervention that we can, we are facing and we have, treatment available where we can prevent a lot of these deformities very early on. And keeping that in mind, let us take the next step. Our professors back in time, I'm sure even now all the professors are teaching the same thing. Take a good history and a proper clinical examination gives you 90 to 95% of your diagnosis extremely clear. That's very important. Blood and x-rays obviously are a part of our uh, routine to make sure that we diagnose the right way, the right uh, differentiate the you know differential diagnosis that we have, and at the same time give the right kind of treatment, appropriate uh, treatment as well as in an appropriate time, which is extremely important. Now let us talk about a few pointers on the history. Manish made a very clear cut uh, you know pointers there, so that's very easy for me. Now any other risk factor, I take it there because. You and I know that we may have hormonal issues, we may have coexisting comorbid conditions, and also some of the seronegative or a seropositive arthritis or any other autoimmune conditions which can coexist. You know, one autoimmune condition doesn't mean that he or she is end of that. No, they can have multiple of them, you know, at the same time, if not, you know, occurring in a different phase of times and then all in one person, we have to identify that and make sure that we are. And mind you, nutrition is one of the biggest, biggest thing that we need to talk about as well. But anyway, I'm not uh, taking there. In terms of the blood test, what we do, the blood test is extremely important. So I'm talking about a few things here. In a profile, I don't want you to do in a profile for every patient walking into your uh, chamber or a consultation room or a hospital. When the ANA is positive, then we can go into the, you know, DSDNA and, and MRA, all those uh, factors. So just be careful and request the laboratory 
if the AMA is positive, only then to run the AMA profile. Otherwise, it's going to cost the patient a huge amount of money there. And we need to pick up the RA factor and the CCP if, you know, uh, anti-circulated citrulline uh, uh, peptide, which is very, very important for us to make sure whether the person is in zero positive or a zero negative arthritis. So that is very important for us. So similarly, electrophoresis to make sure that there is no M band and other things to be there. We need to clearly understand the pain factor. Is it mechanical, inflammatory? This is our responsibility to guide the patient in the right track because the treatment is very important for us. Many of them come extremely late with all this uh, unfortunately uh, uh, in that true sense of term or fortunate well-informed patient is a better patient we say, but still we have much bigger, much better or over uh, informed patient, which they get hyper with uh, little things they see on the press of a button in a phone. So that's the biggest challenge that we face in Bengaluru. I'm sure many of you are also facing that. Now, in a, you know, uh, Anki spine, what do we see? We see it pretty early in teens, we can pick it up. That's very important for us. And 80 to 90% of them are having the human leukocyte antigen positive, very important. It may not be there, but definitely morning stiffness, as Manish was talking about, doesn't have to be 30, but on an average, we talk about it. it could be 10, 15, it could be many uh, minutes later also. This is the biggest thing. A lot of patients come back and tell us early hours in the morning, post midnight, I am getting severe pain. It could be not just in the back, not just in the lower back and sacral region, but in the neck as well. Anchor spine can start majority of the time, a, you know, IS, very, very important, but cervical, we miss many a times. We just say, oh, it's simple cervical spondylitis. Absolutely not. I think we need to make sure that we, we clearly take it up. Enthesis, and enthesophytes, enthesopathy, it's the biggest, biggest challenge. Now, just because I'm a spine surgeon, that doesn't mean that I should look at only spine. Just because I'm an orthopedic surgeon, that doesn't mean that I should neglect the spine. We need to have a wholesome approach to patient. That's where we have the you know, key factor. In fact, today with the online consultations, I see this time and again. I'm gonna share a couple of x-rays later, which was taken just yesterday. You know, it, it's so, so big. It is very rampant. The 6% what we talk about of 1.4 billion is a massive number you know, half the world. It's just not easy, not simple. So we need to be very careful, extra cautious, and make sure that we treat them early. Uh, Dr. Jha, thank you for the slide. And look at this. He is not able to bend at the thoracolumbar region. It is just bending like a U. In fact, uh, you know, it is just bending like this. He doesn't have a bend in the thoracolumbar region. And even the neck is very stiff for him. You know, that's not easy. Now, why is it happening? We are looking at the ALL, anterior you know, spinal ligament, and the PLL, the posterior ligament, also getting you know, tight. It, not just tight, it's just getting to fuse. So that's very important for us to pick it up early so that we don't want to get there. You know? Now, AP view is extremely important. Radiology is a big part of it. Now, there is a very specific reason why this uh, X-ray has been put here. We need the pelvic X-ray. When you say pelvic X-ray, a lot of people just cut off the hip joint. Many times we cut off the ileum so that we miss the upper part of the SI joint, which is very, very important for us. Now, apart from this, if they don't have an access for many of those big uh, investigations, now here, the idea of this slide is again to Im impress upon you, this is not acceptable. This is an oblique view, fantastic. The technician has done a fantastic, uh, you know, but he has not taken a complete picture of the pelvis. That's the reason I'm highlighting here. Make sure that you get a complete picture of the, you know, uh, sacral leg joint, very, very important, and the complete pelvis. Now, we need to talk about the newer things. Yes, ultrasound is very important for us in the entosopathy, but when you talk about the spine, ultrasound may be having limitations there, but MRI picks up in a very big way. So that is very important. Mind you, there is a very, very important learning curve here. The radiologist who is reporting it, the orthopedic surgeon who is also an expert in the MRI reading, uh, radiology, there are a lot of courses which has come conducted. You and I can participate in that and you know, make sure that we pick it up very early and discuss at, at length with a radiologist who is reporting it. Very important for all the juniors 
and the well season orthopedic surgeons to look into this in a very big way. So this is very, very important for us. Now, this is a very busy slide, excuse me, but inflammatory changes and the structural changes. Inflammatory, we pick it up in MRI very early. Structural, we don't want to get there because we have missed the bus in many, many cases. That's the reason we need to be very clear on that and make sure that we don't get into the ankylosis or, you know, uh, that is the biggest challenge. Erosions itself is, we have missed the bus. So hence, when you come into the encephalitis, synovitis, or capsulitis, we pick it up there and treat early. And if you, you and I are not able to treat, refer them. It's a teamwork. I know my limitations. Doesn't mean that you are inferior. No. Patient care is important for us. Hence, we need to make sure that we work as a team and make sure that the complete treatment is given and patient is going to be happy. I'm sure you and I know that. We all have learned this. This is in the history books now. But yes, we also have a press of a button to get into Google, but I'm not going to touch in a, too much of this. Now, coming to the factor of the x-ray. Now, back pain, less than three months or around three months and young patients. If the x-ray, the slide has been slated to two because it's very crowded. I'm going to take the next slide. And then what happens there? If the X-ray is positive, then we look into the axial spondylitis is already there. Now, if that is not there, then we need to look at the you know, staging. Is it into one, two or three or four stages? It could be inflammatory. It could be pain in the buttock, enthesitis, dactylitis, like what Manish was showing on the pictures. I want, didn't want to uh, sort of duplicate there, but I'm going to talk about that. PSA is a very important factor, psoriasis. Today, dermatologists are treating it. So many of us may not see that condition in a big way, thankfully, but still it is missed. And family history is important because you and I have taken history properly. We know that. And there you could have the staging coming in. The next slide shows there where we have a human lycosite, uh, you know, antigen B27 or HLA B27 called as, it could be positive, it could be negative. Then we took a talk about the MRI. In the MRI, it could be still MRI negative, but HLA-B27 positive. So we need to be very clear on that. So that's where we need to look at. And if it is HLA-B27 positive, we need to investigate further and make sure that we clear that very early so that we get the right kind of patient's treatment. Now, American Society for you know, Ankylosing Spondylitis criteria is very well known. So this is, if you have one or two points, you know which staging to come in, which I showed earlier on. And similarly here, it could be HLA-B27 positive and other two features can be coming in, either MRI or dactylitis or psoriatic. Or extremely important point, uh, we talked about, uh, Manish also showed the slide IBD, uh, you know, inflammatory bowel disease and the iritis, you know, which is uveitis coming into picture, you know, eye problem. We have to pick it up in the history and clinical diagnosis is very important for us in examination. Now, this is where we are. Initially, we had a uh, New York criteria. Now, most of us are following the you know, ASAS criteria and the staging it. So it could be MRI, positive or negative, HLA-B27, positive or negative, and other things coming into picture. So that's very important. Why? Because early stage in the X-ray, X-ray is a very, very late stage. We can pick up the, you know, uh, this kind of uh, arthritis very early on. These X-rays are showing, it's a very small one. I'm gonna show the next X-ray in the couple of uh, slides where we can see other things. Now, here, as per them, the diagnosis is made depending on the each vertebral unit and the changes that happens here, which has been given here from zero to six. We don't want to get to vertebral fusion. That's where the whole challenge is for us. So we pick it up early on and treat. I'm emphasizing it time and again, because that's very important. Now here we see that it's already fused. We have missed the bus. Just as a spinal surgeon, you and I are thinking about only the spine. No, come into the hip joint, come into the, you know, uh, it will be fused as well. You know, a sacral joint, get onto the hip joints and it's crazy. It's not easy for them. It's a very disabling and very, very annoying for a surgeon as well as lifestyle, you know, for a patient. So we don't want to get there. So let us make sure that we treat them early. And as a spine surgeon, I'm sure I don't need to talk much about it, but still general orthopedic surgeons and the seasoned orthopedic surgeons are a part of this uh, you know, uh, uh, presentation, hence dish has to be differentiated. You know, this extremely important. Why? Because 
Here, mechanical as well as inflammatory can be done. And here, a lot of changes which we see in the anchi spine is going to be there very earlier on in the X-ray. We're talking about X-ray as well as the MRI. So that's very important for us. Make sure that you differentiate it very early on. Now, this is one thing I want to talk about. I said yesterday I saw a patient. This is where, this is an online. I have no chance to touch the patient. I can only see, I can examine. Five days ago when I recommended all of, almost 95% of the patients whom I recommend for an investigation on the online, they come back to us. And then they, they show the reports to us. The X-ray report yesterday, she took the X-ray yesterday and today afternoon she, in fact, the morning she has uh, reported and uploaded the entire images. I'm sure you can see that here. She also has back pain, which is there for, she's a 50 year old lady. I didn't want to uh, conceal all the details here. And you can see that in 16th August, 2022, it has been done. And the major thing now is you can see the pain, which is go, which she's complaining of. And the changes, what is there in the spine, you can see that it's not just spine. So, so many things are there. And in the pelvis x-ray, you know, whatever best that she could do in a tire two city. She comes from, not from Bangalore where I'm sitting, she comes from over 1,800 to 2,000 miles away, you know, kilometers away. That's where the whole challenge is. Patients are there. You and I are the experts. We can reach out to them and treat them and give them the right kind of treatment. Now, she also has severe pain in the knee joints. And when we ask them for the x-rays or investigations in a tire two, tire three cities, people come back to us and say, yes, I will get it done. This doctor is doing something different. I want this to be, I want to be treated by this and I want to be better. This is the kind of approach I think each one of us look into and I'm sure we can beat this. Take home message is very simple. I want to end this because each of us have very limited time and we can talk about the discussion later. The take home message is pick it up early with a systematic clinical history, clinical examination and supported by the radiology and our blood, we can definitely, definitely pick them early. And with this, I end. Thank you. Thank you folks for giving me the opportunity. I'm going to stop sharing now. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for the elaborative uh, talk. And uh, so we have Professor Paul's uh, video, but I think we, sh we should go for the next lecture. After that, we can run. Then it will be more, uh, you know, better. So uh, if we can go with the next talk uh, by uh, Dr. J. Naresh Babu, sir. Ankylosing spondylitis indications for surgical intervention. After that, we'll be playing Professor Paul's video, and that will be more rational. Over to you, sir. Sir, unmute yourself. And I'll request uh, all speakers, respected speakers, to please stick to time because we have a very back-to-back uh, -back lectures. So we need to, uh, and we, they, we are receiving some questions also. So we'll discuss at the end. Thank you, sir. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, uh, for detailing the parangological part and diagnosis part of the uh, angling spontaneous. I am here to uh, touch upon the basic uh, spinal problems where we require a surgical approach. So it would have been nice uh, if we have had the conservative part first, but anyway, I'll just try to complete the uh, surgical part of it and then we'll go back to you. So pharmacological management. The mainstay of treatment for uh, ankylosing spondylitis treatment is basically a predominantly pharmacological uh, management, but we do have four such a situations uh, of ankylosing spondylitis involving spine, which requires uh, a good uh, surgical management. And missing those things also will be a, a catastrophic uh, events for the uh, patient as well. The first one is the spinal deformity in a fixed flexed post position. If the patient is completely flexed and stooping forwards and the spine is fixed, so that will pose a lot of problems in his uh, daily day-to-day -day activities. I uh, will see how the lecture goes by. And the second uh, problem is stability of the spine when this gets compromised. 
the stability can get compromised in different uh, ways where the patient can have a accidental fall and sustain injury and then which can lead into a highly unstable kind of a spinal fracture or patients can have a anderson lesion uh, which i'm going to touch upon uh, soon uh, that can also pose the problems in causing the uh, instability in the spine third point third uh, issue which requires surgical management is a neurological deficit and many a times all these things cannot happen in isolatedly but they can also have a combination of events where we can have the combination of either fixed deformity or fracture with neurological deficit and these are the four situations which require a, a, a surgical intervention in a patient with ankylosing spondylitis coming to the spinal deformity the type of uh, surgery or uh, indications for surgery depend on the magnitude or the angle of the deformity how much of the patient how much the deformity has progressed and how difficult uh, is uh, uh, the day to day activities and one kind of a, such a severe problem which is a uh, peak of deformities is a chin on chest deformity where the chin gets touched down to the chin and the patient gets completely stooped forwards and this will lead to a kind of functional limitation where the patient is unable to look forward and the patient is completely stooped forwards and can't extend his neck to look forwards and the gaze the visual gaze gets obliterated and they can't have a visual contact it becomes very difficult uh, for the patient to walk or look forward or uh, while driving and sometimes uh, even it uh, have a problems while uh, in a difficulty in eating as well and this difficulty in eating happens in two situations when because of there is a complete loss of uh, lumbar lordosis and the abdomen is uh, tucked inside and the patient cannot have uh, the stomach size of the stomach will be very much obliterated i have had experience with a very typical patient where he has a functional limitation of uh, this patient he is completely stooped forwards that the chin and face is almost touching the knees and he has issue while he is passing urine so the urine used to uh, forcefully come out of his face that is the main uh, difficulty he can't pass urine uh, without uh, soiling his face so those are the functional limitations of this patient this is one of the patient uh, of ankylosing spondylitis we can observe this patient sitting comfortably and you can see the both hips are adducted and internally rotated and you could not separate the hips so we can suspect a kind of a hip pathology also involved here but the main problem of this patient is when he tries to get up that's much uh, that's what he can have so he he is completely stooped forwards he can only see ahead when he sits so these are the situations which forces uh, the patients uh, into uh, very difficult uh, uh, positions where we need to correct these deformities and bring the bring back the spine into normal sagittal alignment Uh, to have a, a good uh, uh, visual gaze this is another patient uh, who, who you can see that completely stoop forwards uh, there is a loss of lumbar lordosis and he is he is able to extend the neck a bit and then he can see forwards uh, to have a visual gaze but his neck also stuck in that particular posture so these patients are the ones which are uh, unless addressed now this becomes very difficult uh, to manage this patient and this is how he walks he can't even uh, Uh, look forwards is completely stooped forwards and then he has to extend his neck and use lot of force uh, and muscular strain to actually look forwards to have a visual gaze uh, so without having an accident and these patients have a lot of issues when they try to lie down also see this patient has got completely stiff spine completely curved into like a c shaped uh, spine and when he lies down that is the position which he is to lie down so he needs a lot of uh, pillows uh, uh, to support his uh, neck back the upper back and the lower back and sometimes he needs to keep the pillows under the knees uh, to just make uh, make him uh, lay down so this is not only issue uh, for the patient but if you are trying to correct these patients or you are going to correct the spinal deformity and have a visual gaze so this also poses problems not only for positioning the patient on the table but also for intubation or getting an access a airway access it is very difficult because we need to we have to come forward and put the tube so we can't put tube like that so those situations uh, we tend to use uh, a, this is the neck is lifted up this is a different patient where you will see the thoracic hyperkyphosis and we are going to operate on this patient so we had to put a lot of pillows 
to support his neck into his regular neutral position uh, to make the spine and we have to sometimes use the flexible uh, scopes to uh, to pass the tube uh, to get a airway access into the patients and once you position the patient again it becomes very difficult for you to position the patient because the spines uh, they will be uh, lying up uh, without supporting any part of chest will be lying in the air and only forehead will be touching and knees will be touching so we need a lot of padding and customized pillows uh, we need to have a position the patients before itself uh, on a couch or bed how they are going to lie pro then you will have an idea of how much uh, uh, the support uh, you need to keep for the bolsters or the pillows uh, for the patient to have a so we can't uh, turn the patient and look for the objects to position the patient. We need to have a prior planning in these patients to get this access. So this patient, uh, we have operated actually this, so you can see this patient has a very good uh, thoracic kyphosis and lumbar lord is, uh, cervical lordosis is also maintained. But his problem, why he is stooping forwards is there is no lumbar lordosis. So there is a straight lumbar spine and the rest of the thoracic spine is completely uh, fused. So these patients, if you can create a kind of lumbar lordosis and then lift the patient up the th uh, at the lumbar spine, and you get a lordosis in the lumbar spine, the entire spine upwards will get uh, lifted up and the patient can have a, a straighter spine and then abdomen opens up. You can see how much of uh, uh, correction can be achieved by doing a simple uh, lumbar uh, osteotomy and correcting the spine and, and lifting the spine and making the advantage of taking the advantage of thoracic kyphosis and cervical lordosis which is fixed and they can just uh, avoid fusing the entire spine and you can only need to uh, fix the uh, thoracolumbar spine and get to recreate the lordosis. So by this way you can have, you can see the, the gaze is maintained, patient can now look forward and you can see the abdomen has opened up, you can see previously uh, the abdomen is completely tucked inside, there is no space for, space for the stomach to accommodate the food. Now we can have a straighter spine and then look uh, upwards. Uh, this is how the patient was uh, when he was uh, walking before. When you operate on this patient, you are able to uh, stretch up this spine and then can have a, a good uh, upright posture and visual gaze can be maintained very well. But there it doesn't end the matter. So if you have corrected the spine, but you can see this uh, hips are arthritic and future, uh, I think you will come back with uh, stiff hips and then we need to address uh, those things as well. It becomes difficult uh, to decide on which way has to be done first, either the hips need to be done first or the spine needs to be done first. But this patient where he has got some flexibility on the hips, I think spine has taken the priority and we have corrected the spine. And during the spine also we need to have a lot of uh, big constructs because you are osteotomizing not the spine, you should think like you are osteotomizing the long bone because this bone is entirely fused and it's like a single uh, segment of the bone. So you need a lot of anchor points. And there is a spinal cord inside which you need to protect as well to not to develop a neurological deficit. So what we use, we use the double rod constructs across the osteotomy. We use an additional rod onto the left side so that the, the osteotomy can be maintained and thoroughly uh, fixed. And these patients are also osteoporotic. So we need to have a very good uh, foundation points and uh, uh, fixation points. So this patient has got uh, a nicely uh, leveled up and then corrected. These are the few indications uh, for the deformity where you have to operate on these patients otherwise they will end up in uh, uh, they'll have issues with their uh, daily activities of uh, living other area where you need to uh, intervene surgically is when the spine stability is compromised these are the situations which are not so severe as the case which i showed before these are situations where you can see like there is a crack opening of the hyperextension injury of the spine because uh, the spine has opened up in the front and it uh, corrects this is one typical situation you need to always observe when the patient with ankylosing spondylitis who has a kyphosis deformity or a deformity of the spine comes back to you and says that I had a small catch on the back and now my spine looks straight. If any patient says that I have a catch in the spine, very mild pain but my spine looks straighter now, I am very happy. So those are the situations which are going to be potentially dangerous and cause a neurological deficit because the patient might have got a crack opening on the front and so instead of a three column fracture you have might have got only the anterior column and middle column fractured and the spine has opened up and then the posterior column is still uh, intact that's what is keeping the spine intact 
that will also soon break and the patient will have a catastrophic neurological deficit which is very difficult to uh, correct so you need to be very very cautious when the patient with the background of a, a, a regular pain comes back with the increased uh, back pain at particular area and there is a tenderness there uh, we have to investigate the patient and find out whether there is any lesion anderson lesion which is uh, existing in the spine so this this is like a small uh, example where this patient has come up with and respond with a sir sorry to interrupt you uh, just we need to pass an up because we have how much time i trust so maybe a minute 30 second to one minute sir yeah, yeah. So there is a crack in the spine and you can see the spine has uh, completely broken and uh, you can see there is a dislocation of the spine uh, which has uh, led to uh, neurological deficit. So these are the ones uh, which are also called uh, Anderson lesions and they present as a pseudo spondylodiscitis. The picture looks like spondylodiscitis. There is increased white signal in the spine and you can also see the uh, dark signal in the T1 and there is a, a defect uh, in the front. So the first look, even radiologist also gets confused and they will give report as a spondylodiscitis because you can closely observe the, uh, the hypo intensity goes all the way from front to back and there is a crack across the spine with involving the spine as well. So those are the situations uh, which are very dangerous and you need to intervene uh, with these patients. We should think them as a long bone fractures, not like a, a spinal compression fractures which can be easily managed conservatively. This patient we have to operate with the fixation and then uh, use the spine stability. The neurological deficit, as I uh, told you before, when there is a compression in the spine, that can also lead to a, a cord compression and patient can end up with cervical myelopathy. And this can also have in combination. So this patient not only had a cord compression, but also there is a fracture, instability across the spine, and there is a broken of the astrophytes in the front, and then there is a posterior arch fracture as well. So this has to be fixed and uh, managed with the uh, plating. So these are the four situations uh, which are very uh, important to pick up in a regular practice when the pa your patient you are following for a long time for a conservative management and the pharmacological man treatment and the patient comes back with these kind of situations, we should think that there is an indication for surgery. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I think we'll go to the uh, lecture video of Professor Ekepal. And then we'll go to the next lecture. So I'm starting sharing my screen. Okay. So is it visible? May I start? Yes, visible. Good evening, everybody. Today, my topic of discussion is the role of total hip replacement in spondyl arthropathy. All of you know the hip involvement occurs in 30 to 50 percent of the patients in spondyl arthropathy and 90 percent of the patients among those with affected hips have bilateral involvement. Typically it reflects the associated prevalence of the HLA B27 gene. Younger the age on the onset and the greater is the likelihood of the hip involvement. And what are the risk factors? The male axial disease and the encephalitis are the regarded as risk factors of the hip involvement. Whereas Total hip replacements, it remains the most effective treatment strategy to relieve the pain and improve the ambulatory status of these patients. The aim of the THR is not only the pain relief, also the eradication of the flexion contracture, increased range of motion of the hip joint, improved mobility and correction of the postures. There are several preoperative considerations from the anesthetic perspective as there is restricted thoracic spinal motion restriction, so there is a less chest expansion so pulmonary function testing is advised before surgery a the spine along with limited mouth opening due to involvement of the temporomandibular joints makes the intubation difficult therefore the fiber optic intubation is generally preferred whereas the complications such as the atelectasis and the pneumonia in the postoperative period is a high possibility therefore the icu backup is mandatory so there are orthopedic perspective, patient's age, activity levels and the expectations should be properly counseled with the patient's relatives. There are thorough physical examination to be done regarding the spinal involvement, pelvic obliquity, everything. And the radiographs of the entire spine should be examined to rule out the presence of the pseudoarthrosis or the Anderson lesions, which can lead to some uh, reduction of the uh, problems 
terms of defeat uh, there is some reduction of those results and some uh, symptomatic uh, problems after the total hip replacements that should be sorted out now there are preoperative workup there are preoperative standing lateral view radiograph and the lateral spino pelvic radiograph in the standing and the sitting position of the pelvis as also the ct scan to see the pelvic mal rotation is required to prevent the positioning error of the astrocular component whereas the preoperative templating is extremely important to uh, to estimate the accurate size and position of the astrocular cup and if the patient is on methotrexate it should not be stopped it should be continued whereas the biologics it should be stopped at least two treatment cycles before the operation now suppose see this is the case this is very difficult to identify the center of the rotation so in that case it's, it is a tip say good for the operation now suppose see this is the case this is very difficult to identify the center of the rotation so in that case it's, it is a tip say so this much of video has come from professor pal actually so now i invite dr ravi gupta to talk on swanlo arthropathy the current concepts he is the director of orthopedic sports hospital mohali dr ravi gupta please thank you dr arthi and uh, you know since we are doing it for indian orthopedic association i think this is such an important topic chosen by ioa where the general orthopedic surgeon needs to be aware of the condition because as i move into the lecture we'll come to know that the main problem is when it the first patient is seen by the generalists and the diagnosis gets delayed for a long time resulting into some irreversible permanent changes which can nowadays be avoided since we have excellent treatment so with this background i move on to the current concepts actually you know many of the concepts have already been spoken by my previous speakers but you know sometimes we say the repetition is important for the sake of laying the stress so in this lecture i will be dealing with the terminologies which are being used or which have been used and the classification if any what is the current load of the problem especially in our country and what is the recent diagnostic criteria which should be used by our general orthopedic surgeons and i will just give an overview of the algorithm of treatment so i would say if someone you know wants to venture into treating the patients one should be you know uh, kind of developing a special area of interest into this field or for beginners they can diagnose and refer the patient to the specialists and lastly i will also talk about the current occupational and social impacts of the problem in our society so when we say spondyloarthropathy it is a group of overlapping disorders of chronic inflammatory diseases of autoimmune nature sharing certain clinical features and common genetic associations with hla b27 so here i would like to say it is actually a systemic disease so initially in our mbbs days we thought ankylosing spondylitis means only spine but it's a you know group of disorders which we will talk in the next slides the older classification was you know we used to read zero positive rheumatoid arthritis and zero negative but now whenever the ra factor is negative we call it as spondyloarthropathy so we don't say it's a zero negative rheumatoid arthritis so this spondyloarthropathy can be further a peripheral spondyloarthropathy where the musculoskeletal areas other than the spine and sacroiliac joint are involved and the second is axial spondyloarthropathy where the spine as well as the sacroiliac joints are involved 
so when i say spondyloarthritis or arthropathy so that means the earlier terminology of zero negative arthritis so zero negative when we call so that means the rheumatoid arthritis is negative so this is the total scenario as i mentioned there are two basic types the axial and the peripheral but there is lot of overlapping so one may start here like psoriatic arthritis after a few days he may go into you know the typical the ankylosing spondylitis there may be undifferentiated overlapping with the reactive arthritis which develops after you know some episodes of diarrhea or this urethritis and then there may be inflammatory bowel disease in the form of crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis and then there will be typical axial spondyloarthropathy which is radiological and also more importantly non radiological where the the standard criteria which has been mentioned by one of the speakers as the modified new york criteria so according to that the x ray is the mainstay of diagnosis but you know we need to diagnose these patients before they have changes in the x ray so that was known as non radiographic but now the mri is helping us we'll talk in the next few slides so what is the typical extra articular manifestations it may be anterior uveitis or just the psoriatic patches on the skin inflammatory bowel disease as i already mentioned and there may be presence of enthesitis the commonest being the heel pain what we call as the you know the posterior tendoachylus bursitis or tendinitis or even plantar fasciitis then dactylitis in the hands is another manifestation now if we talk about the problem the load of the problem in our country the dr goswami is one person who was ex aims delhi who has done lot of research in spondyloarthritis the prevalence is 0.03% to 0.2% and this is a common disease actually only second to rheumatoid arthritis the prevalence has been linked to the presence of hla b27 in the normal population and in india it has been uh, studied and it is equivalent to the west also the 6% of our normal population they have ankylosing uh, this hla b27 but all of them they don't well the spondyloarthropathy low back ache patients who are you know this is one of the uh, common opds for all orthopedic surgeons out of these 1 to 2% patients are likely to be suffering from spondyloarthritis so whenever you see a non specific low back ache you must you know not forget that it can be a patient of spondyloarthritis earlier studies they showed that the males were predominantly much much highly involved to the rate of 18 to 1 but recent studies show that the 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 ratio is 3 is to 1 rather for non radiological it is almost the same between the males and females the main reason is that now the awareness is more for diagnosis so earlier patients in the females were not being diagnosed uh, so the the incidence the ratio was Uh, reported to be low there is higher peripheral arthritis reported amongst the indian axial spondyloarthritis patients so as i mentioned earlier when we say ankylosing spondylitis or sacroiliitis that can involve the peripheral joints as well now the average delay in diagnosis of this condition is 5 to 6 years and the range is 5 to 11 years so which is you know not very good so if you are delaying your diagnosis for so many years some irreversible changes are bound to occur so what is the reason for that because earlier we were diagnosing only with x ray so radiographic changes they take lot of time to develop presenting symptoms may not be specific and criteria used to diagnose ankylosing spondylitis which is you know like the new york criteria although we are changing now i will come in the next slide was not very very sensitive and lastly but more importantly for our country many physicians they have inadequate knowledge our especially the orthopedic colleagues about the the spondyloarthropathy and they underestimate the prevalence so this slide is very important from an 
study from an Indian scientist, the uh, Dr. Reddy et al. They have shown that on the in this pi diagram, out of 100 patients, only 31 were diagnosed. So the rest of the patients, the diagnosis was missed. And the main reason was because these were the symptoms and these were the diagnosis made by our orthopedic colleagues like sciatica, mechanical injury, pregnancy-induced backache, spur, osteoporosis, and many others. So we must not, you know, uh, remove it from our mind that these diagnoses may be actually spondyloarthropathy. This side of the slide is also very important because our patients, they visit multiple type of alternative physicians and, you know, that is one of the reasons they miss the diagnosis. This study has also highlighted a very important fact that 58% of our patients, more than half, they thought allopathic medications, they cause serious side effects. So we need to create awareness amongst our colleagues, as well as in the general population, that if you delay the treatment, the damage is much more than the side effects of the drugs. 25% of the patients, they believe that doctors deliberately concealed the side effects. So we need to be, you know, having a lot of, you know, community education on this issue as well. So I will request our president of IUA that it is our responsibility to go to the general population also. So when we think about the latest, this is the ASA, AS criteria, which is being followed mostly chronic backache at least for three months or more, and age is less than 45 years. Any of these two is present, either sacroiliitis on imaging means X-ray, plus any, or, any one of these criteria, one or more. Or the second scenario is with this one, HLA B27 is positive, plus any two of these criteria. So that means the sacroiliitis was not there on the right side, only HLA B27 positive was there. But then you need two criteria from the features of spondyloarthritis. Another important fact is it has been seen that I mentioned it takes at least five years delay. So why that was taking the MRI was not there. If you get undifferentiated spondyloarthritis or axial spondyloarthritis, which doesn't show radiological features, you get the MRI, you may be able to pick up those cases at least five years before. Then after five years, the X-ray features, they start appearing. And if you still delay that more than 10 years after the onset of the disease, then you see some permanent changes in the spine as well in the form of syndesmophytes. So that means you have already done the damage. So we need to diagnose them at earlier age. Another very important recent research shows that in all the patients of spondyloarthropathies, at least 60%, they have alterations of the gut epithelial and vascular barrier, which leads to increased permeability of the gut, leading to absorption of the products of those bacteria and then autoimmunity against them. So gut dysbiosis, when we say it is either before the onset of the disease or even after the gut inflammation has started. So what has been seen is there is some abundance of some bacteria. I will not name these five bacteria. And then there is some decrease in some bacteria which are normally present. So that is dysbiosis. So if we are able to find the markers for these bacteria even, then you know the biomarkers nowadays, the molecular biology is coming up in a very big way. We will be able to diagnose these patients even without MRI with the help of the biomarkers but that is still a dream. Yesterday, I was in a ICMR meeting in Delhi. We had around 100 projects from India. So I think a lot of good work is being done, even at molecular biology. So we need to, as orthopedic surgeons, collaborate with the, our biomedical engineers so that we can find out some way to develop these biomarkers in the form of strips or otherwise. This is the current algorithm of treatment as this is the combined, I'll finish in just next one minute. This is one of the last slides. So in 2017, ASS, AS and Jular, they gave a combined recommendation of the treatment. In the first line of treatment, they say the NSAIDs plus 
education, exercise, physical therapy, rehab, change of lifestyle. So I think this is what Baba Ramdev is doing and our orthopedic colleagues are lacking this. So we need to develop, you know, we need to delve on these issues. We need to spend time on non-pharmacological treatment also, maybe through our physiotherapist or we can guide them ourselves that, you know, the daily yoga exercises or other exercises, some physical therapy. So they are an important ingredient of the treatment. And then of course, they may need local steroids into the joints. And, you know, sometimes you can use this synthetic, uh, you know, sulfa -salazine. The second line of treatment is the biologicals and they are mainly TNF alpha inhibitor and IL-17 inhibitor. The others are also coming up, but you know, uh, again, some people now think that the biologicals can be the first line of treatment. And lastly, there can be surgery. So my last part is the impact. We have seen that many of these patients, they get absent from their work because of the pain. Even when they are present, their efficiency is less than 50%. We call it as presentism. They are coming, but the efficiency work productivity is not there. So more days are required with outside help. And then the days with the family and social activities is also missed. This is one of the study from abroad where you know the people, they missed their work in a year for so many days. So this is also important impact on our society. This is an Indian study, which shows that the 8% of the patients had to seize employment. They could not work. So this is so big a problem. So daily activities were affected up to 40% of the patients and presentism was in 20%. So one in five patients, they could not give work productivity and impact on work productivity is again 20%. So in summary, we must be aware with the recent current terminology in the line with the international terminology so that our research can be communicated in a similar manner at the international level. We should create awareness amongst our journalists, especially the orthopedic leagues about the current concepts we must follow the latest criteria of the early diagnosis as well as the treatment. And we should be aware of what is the impact of this disease in the society. Thank you very much. So Ravi has got a very good uh, wisdom. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for the detailed and elaborative lecture. So may I call upon our next speaker, Dr. D. Raja. Uh, spondylar arthropathy and spond pathogenesis and uh, may i request all the respective speakers to be uh, strict up to six minutes and because we have uh, many more lectures left uh, but we are running very short of time so i can uh, give a reminder on five minutes uh, so please don't feel disturbed. dr arnab yes, i sir. think we decided about 10 minutes let's not you know make the lectures of the other speakers because the first speakers took more time. So it's better to be a little late rather than, you know, the otherwise people will not understand in five minutes. If someone has no made problem. it for 10 minutes, you, yeah. No problems. So thank you. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, pathogenesis of spondyl arthritis and uh, ankylosing spondylitis. So why we, we are talking about pathogenesis? Because there is a limited knowledge of the pathogenesis and there is confusion in diagnosis, as we already discussed in the previous lecture. Uh, we don't know what is the current uh, best investigation. A lot of patients have a X-ray and CT scan, and still they are not able to diagnose. And available treatment option, especially the newer disease-modifying therapeutics like uh, TNF alpha inhibitor and interleukin 17, we may not be able to understand uh, unless we understand the uh, uh, pathogenesis and modification of therapy before surgery is also uh, very important. So I already discussed what is spondyl arthritis. It is inflammation and pain and stiffness of the spine and pelvic joints, also associated with the enthesitis. And these group of uh, uh, pathologies have HLA-B27 as a common link. Other extra-articular manifestations include anterior uh, uh, UIT, psoriasis, and inflammatory bowel disease diseases also have spondyl arthritis. We saw this slide before, but it's being repeated because the progression of spondyl arthritis uh, happens over time, doesn't develop overnight. There's a period of five to 10 years before your uh, spondyl arthritis develops in, into your actual ankylosing spondylitis, which is more debilitating. 
So we have pre-radiographic stage where there is only inflammatory back pain and peripheral arthritis and enthesitis. So patients have uh, normal x-rays. They present with inflammatory type of uh, pain, early morning back pain, back pain, sometimes peripheral arthritis and enthesitis. Then they progress to uh, sacroiliitis, uh, which is uh, uh, can be picked up in the early stage in the MRI and later in the X-ray as well. Then eventual syndesmosoid formation and, uh, stip and bony ankylosing happens. So there is a period of five to 10 years before we can actually make a diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis, unless you know the uh, progression of a disease and pathology behind this disease. So as we said, there is a pre-radiographic uh, uh, stage where we can pick up this uh, diagnosis in the MRI that uh, you can see uh, act, active uh, inflammation happening in the spine and sacral leg joint. So as you know, ankylosing spondylitis is, uh, uh, progresses to radiological sacroiliitis over many years. It causes uh, severe uh, debility for the patient. And uh, inflammatory back pain is always associated with some type of uh, extra-articular, extra-spinal uh, problem like uh, enthesitis or uveitis. So presence of inflammatory back pain with one other marker like uh, enthesitis or uveitis is diagnostic of ankylosing spondylitis. The pathogenesis, uh, there are uh, different theories. There is no definite uh, pathology as such described. There are only theories. But the most relevant things are uh, these, genetic risk factors, immune reaction, microbiological infection, and endocrine abnormality. So genetic background uh, is really very relevant because uh, uh, there is a high incidence of familial aggregation and major histocompatibility uh, gene HLA-B27 has been linked to this type of uh, pathologies. And there are other major histocompatibility genes other than uh, HLA-B27 and non-MHC genes which are uh, causing this pathology. So uh, any patient who is genetically susceptible, you can see this familial aggregation, especially in uh, concordant uh, rates in identical twins as, a, as high as 63%. So in identical twins, the incidence of uh, disease is as much, as much as 63%. If it is a non-identical twins, it is 23%. This itself says, uh, shows that there is a, a high, relate, high rate of uh, uh, genetic predisposition. In first and second degree relatives, also there is higher incidence and uh, the incidence comes down as we uh, go down the uh, family tree. So HLA B27 is an important, important genetic marker associated with ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, it, it is very useful when you are assessing the first degree relative of any HLA B27 positive patient with ankylosing spondylitis. They have one in three risk. It is uh, autosomal co-dominant inheritance. 5 to 10% of the patients uh, with HLA B27 positive patients will develop, uh, people will develop ankylosing spondylitis over time. And 20% develop reactive arthropathy when they come in contact with uh, chlamydia or salmonella infection. Male members show preponderance over female in HLA B27 positivity. Uh, people in the age group of 21 to 39 years are most vulnerable. We also see infection as a trigger in reactive arthritis. We very well know infective arthritis is uh, uh, usually starts after a GI infection or urinary tract infection. There is definitely there is a correlation between the infectious trigger and spondyl arthritis. In uh, ankylosing spondylitis, there is a correlation between bacteroids infection, and also 50% of the ankylosing spondylitis have some uh, inflammation in the ileum when we see through the ileocolonoscopy. So recent uh, uh, literature shows a lot of correlation between the gut microbiome micro and these uh, bacteria, what they are described. And they have uh, differences between normal healthy controls. Klebsiella pneumonia is, is also one uh, bacteria which is uh, shown to have as a acts as an exacerbating agent of the autoimmune phenomenon. And uh, Klebsiella pneumonia also interacts with the HLA-B27 uh, uh, gene. And they have relative immune deficiency as well. So the immunological and microbiological factors has been uh, also contributed to ankylosing spondylitis. So we look at the actual pathogenesis. The HLA B27 is, has a high correlation with the uh, pathology. And uh, there is biochemical structure, there is modification of the biochemical structure of the protein and alternation of a conformation of the HLA heavy chain happens. This triggers an immune uh, reaction. So you look at the uh, uh, actual pathology in the molecular level. There is octoreactive CD8 plus uh, T cell receptor. 
which interacts with arthritic peptides, so which is uh, attaches to the HLA B27 and which is taken up by the antigen presenting cells, mainly the macrophages, B cells, and dendritic cells. Macrophages are in the circulation, B cells are abundant in the uh, gut. And these uh, cells, once they take up this uh, uh, abnormal HLA B27 protein, it causes unfolding of the endoplasmic retinoculum. And due to this, that, it causes a release of interleukin 23 and other uh, factors like interleukin 17. So, this interleukin 17 causes immune response. It causes further release of inflammatory mediators and overproduction of interleukin 23. And is, this biosis of the gut also leads to uh, production of interleukin 17 and interleukin 23. These, in effect, act on the osteocells, osteocytes, fibro, fibroblasts, and macrophages and causes release of tumor necrosis factor alpha. This acts on the uh, end target uh, of the uh, body in the musculoskeletal system, which acts on the uh, skeletal system, uh, joints, and the gut causing uh, ankylosing spondylitis uh, features like syndesmophoid formation, arthritis of the joint, and uh, iliocolonal inflammation. So you can see the basic uh, uh, network, the molecular uh, chain. Uh, tumor necrosis factors alpha forms the important mediator, end mediator of the, all this inflammation and interleukin 17 and 22 also contribute. So if you have an idea about this molecular uh, pathology, we have now monoclonal antibodies, which specifically uh, target these uh, uh, mediators and cause uh, uh, suppression of symptoms and control of uh, symptoms and delay the progression of the disease. So uh, TNF-alpha uh, inhibitor like infliximab, interleukin 17 inhibitor like sequicinumab are useful in, when you're treating you and closing spontaneous patient not controlled with your NSAIDs. So similarly, the pathology of uh, peripheral uh, spondyl arthropathy, psoriatic arthritis, we have seen that they have uh, skin lesions followed uh, five to 10 years later, they develop uh, uh, spondyl arthritis. So they have dactylitis, spondyl arthritis, and uh, uveitis. So again, the transition of psoriasis to psoriatic arthritis, there is a lag period. Psoriasis, uh, after a few years, present with preclinical psoriatic arthritis, then there is a subclinical phase, prodromal phase, then actually they develop full bone psoriatic arthritis. So knowing this uh, uh, stages of development help us to uh, actually diagnose them early and treat appropriately with specific uh, monoclonal antibodies. So I conclude by saying you need to understand the pathogenesis of spinal arthritis to make a diagnosis, do the relevant investigation and start disease modifying therapeutics early if they are stopped responding to your conventional NSAIDs. And you should know when to stop these uh, monoclonal antibodies before your electric surgery. Thank you. So, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Raja, for giving a nice lecture on pathogenesis. And uh, so far, the program is running well, except for the time. We are running a little late as far as time is concerned. So, with that, uh, may I call upon Dr. Abhay Thans. He is from Ames, Jodhpur. He will be talking on evolution management, management evolution, Dr. Abhay. And I request Dr. Abhay if he can cut down a little bit of his lecture so that we can save some time. Thank you. Okay, I will. Thank you so much. And uh, my brief today is to talk on evolution of management and basically how uh, the use of biologics has come around. So what most of what I've, I'm going to touch upon has already been covered. And it's great to have some repetition when you're talking of something important. So with what we're going to talk of in the next six or seven minutes is what is structural progression and how is it correlated to basically addressing treatment needs, radiographic techniques, which are important for monitoring progression, predictors of structural progression, goals of treatment, currently available treatment options, which are NSIDs, TNF alphas, and basically what is the role of infliximab and sicukinumab. So what is structural progression? That is essentially the change of uh, two MSAI, uh, MSAS, MSAS units in two years at the rate of more than one unit per year. And that essentially dis decides how and what is going to be the actual uh, uh, structural damage in the presence of an ankylosing spondylitis or a spondyloarthropathy. 
So radiographic techniques, which are important for monitoring structural progression, essentially, these are the conventional radiographs, the CTs, the spectral CTs, ultrasounds, MRIs, and the different modalities of uh, uh, MRIs, which, can, which are available today. And on basically two counts, uh, all these investigations are utilized. One is to see the inflammatory nature of the changes, and the other is to see the structural damage because of the inflammatory parameters. And if you see, the CT scan is a very, very useful tool as it is extremely important and shows us what is the kind of structural change or chronic damage that has happened over the, uh, over the skeleton. And the other thing is the, the MRI, various different scans which have utility in identifying the MRI needs. For example, sacroiliitis and basically perisacroiliac osteitis can be beautifully uh, uh, demonstrated with the use of an MRI scan. So what are the predictors for structural, structural progression? Essentially, these are the habit, the disease activity, inflammatory markers, and the radiological markers. And the two predictors for structural progression are the disease activity predictors, which are the ankylosing spondylitis disease activity score, that is the ASDAS, and the Bath ankylosing spondylitis disease activity. And both these parameters have a very significant p-value change and it correlates extremely well with the uh, uh, structural progression of the spondyloarthropathy. Now, essentially, the predictors are uh, with which habit predictors are present in different individuals, and it has been observed that smoking is one of the most important predictors for progression of disease, and smokers often suffer a dose-dependent deterioration in the structural damage over a period of two years. The other inflammatory markers, ESR and CRP, both have been correlated with progression of disease, but they are slightly nonspecific in the sense that uh, the predictors are uh, present in about 70 to 80% of axial spondyloarthropathies. So what are the goals of treatment? Essentially, the goals are to maintain quality of life, to control symptoms and inflammation, and to prevent structural damage. And what, are, what is the current scenario and the dilemma? The current scenario essentially according to the ULAR uh, criteria is what should be the end target of therapy and what should be the optimum time of initiation of therapy. So the current available treatment options as has already been discuss discussed is the NSIDs, the TNF alpha inhibitors and the IL-17A inhibitors. The current available options so very clearly enunciate that the NSAIDs are the first uh, point focus of treatment. These provide pain relief and suppression of inflammation, and the treatment goals in axial spondyloarthropathies focus on potential deceleration and the arrest of damage. If one has to emphasize and find out what is the actual effect of NSAIDs, it is essentially symptom control and functional improvement. Whether non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs help in stopping or slowing radiographic progression, there is some evidence to say for and more, a lot of evidence to say against. So one really does not know if NCIDs do stop progression of disease, but they definitely help in symptom control and functional improvement. The next, uh, uh, the next drugs which are useful are the TNF-alpha inhibitors, and it is a very important uh, mediator of inflammatory, mediator of disease, and that forms the basis of a lot of uh, uh, biologics that are in the market. And what is important to understand is that it is increasingly, increasingly being emphasized that TNF-alpha inhibitors are uh, important not only for uh, end-stage disease, but also for early-stage management of disease to prevent uh, disease progression. And it has been uh, also emphasized, as has already been discussed by previous speakers, and Dr. Ravi Gupta said that early use of the TNF-alpha inhibitors has been recommended for patients who are diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis according to the uh, NY criteria and treated with more than uh, two non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs over three months, whether early or later in the stage of disease management. So certain types of treatments uh, have been indicated to progress over, and uh, a lot of studies have been done on this, and especially to highlight which spinal lesions are associated with newborn formation, especially with angst spawns treated with TNF-alpha agents. 
So the type of lesions that progress are essentially those where signs of inflammation are present without any other pathologic finding in parallel and those in which the signs of inflammation have a concomitant fat signal. Fat signals without signs of inflammation and some we have no lesions at all. What is the effect of TNF-alpha therapy on newborn formation? Current evidence demonstrates a mixed role, but continuous long-term anti-TNF therapy has shown does not lead to an increase in the rate of newborn formation over eight years in patients with ankylosing spondylitis. And the, and the picture that has, been, that has evolved over a period of time says that over two years of TNF-alpha inhibitor has had no effect on structural progression. So clearly the picture is very mixed and one does, really does not know uh, which way to profess one way or the other. So the, the picture is uh, mixed and uh, the evidence is both for and against this particular theory. So what are the theories as to why fusion proceeds despite there being an inflammation control? Probably because the joint fusion is triggered by the initial inflammatory insult rather than the later uh, progression of uh, disease. It is possible that the low levels of inflammation persist uh, irrespective of uh, inflammation control, which drive joint ankylosis. And fusion essentially is a consequence of inflammation itself, whether it is related to a TNF alpha therapy, that remains controversial and still to be understood. So infliximab and secunicumab are two drugs which help, and a very brief touch upon what they do. So over eight years of infliximab has demonstrated that there is no effect on structural progression and inhibition as compared to patients who do not receive biologics. And sicokinumab has uh, a fully, uh, a fully uh, human uh, anti-deinterleukin anti 17A monoclonal antibody has demonstrated sustained improvements in the signs and symptoms of ankylosing spondylitis through two years. So, so much for now, and I would leave the rest to be covered by subsequent speakers. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arhe, for a short and sweet lecture. Now, with great honor, uh, I invite a legendary figure from Calcutta, Professor Biplav Acharya, sir. He will be talking on the, his experiences on spinal orthopathy. Sir uh, needs no introduction, but uh, it's a really a great uh, pleasure and privilege, sir, that you are here. After a long time, we, uh, we are seeing you on the screen. And uh, sir is our teacher. We have learned so many things, sir, from you. So again, it's a privilege for us to learn you from you. So Professor Bipla Bacharya, sir. Thank you. Thank you all, and thank you the organizer of Iowa Indian Orthopedic Association and the scientific um, section of the Iowa In Indian Orthopedic Association. First of all, I want to say that the spinal arthroplasty, arthritis, Arthropathy and the uh, spa is the same thing, but the cause is different. It's difficult to diagnose which is responsible for these particular problems. For that, we require patient. We require some investigation according to the need. And everybody knows that it is an autoimmune disease. And autoimmune disease uh, has a, um, um, uh, it has a multiple organ disorder. So patients usually come with a low back pain and fatigueness like that and then and we want to lo localize who is the cause what is the cause of this low, low, pain 
it is known that the orthopedic surgeon should examine the patient thoroughly. It is essential. And after that, they will conclude the cause of the this low back pain and others. Without proper examination, it is very difficult. Only by investigation, it cannot be done. And in advanced stages, now the MRI comes up. Before that, there is a radiology, X-ray, and you, everybody knows that uh, in NIS medical, when I was house surgeon, and there is a center of rheumatology clinic, and Professor Dev was, and Professor Orthopedics, and Professor Monumitti was in medicine, come, uh, come up. Uh, after their retirement, the clinic is about to be closed. Uh, this is the job of the Indian Orthopedic Association to bring up how to make the the clinic survive. And you everybody knows that the uh, arthropathy, the most cases, the drugs, anti rheumatoid drug, you know, the the criteria of the uh, rheumatoid arthritis affecting the spine and you everybody knows the drugs, the NSAID, anti um, uh, steroid drug and DMRD, disease modifying <coughs> rheumatoid arthritis drugs and surgery requires a less Ankylosing spondylitis is the common problem of the spa, spinal arthropathy. In our country, the ankylosing spondylitis is less as, as already told by other speakers. And in our country, rheumatoid arthritis is, is less. For that, uh, we use the anti rheumatoid drug and the somebody mentioned that the uh, anti that is the tumor necrosing factor it has it has a good effect but monitoring is very essential it is not possible in the subdivision and district hospital in india even in the teaching institution so it has a bad side effect. So we usually use the disease modifying drugs or remodeled arthritis against remodeled arthritis. Everybody knows. So in um, uh, spinal surgery, it requires the excision of the synovial membrane and fusion of the um, uh, joints, that the facet joints in cervical spine, you, uh, usually in the already mentioned in the ankylosing spondylitis cartilage osteotomy, but it is not so easy. It is very difficult to final cartilage osteotomy because the correction is necessary all around the spinal cord. So this is my observation in a small period, though I didn't get good um, environment for and for the uh, work that is the rheumatoid arthritis. It is essential. Now, our, um, uh, in our um, state, Dr. Partho has taken the responsibility for uh, developing this and see he requires sometimes he usually do the spinal surgery. Thank you all. Thank you the IOA and thank you the scientific science scientific subcommittee. Thank you.
thank you sir thank you very much for the uh, the the gist you have uh, presented over here so really it's uh, highly appreciable and uh, we will take care of your words now uh, we move on to the next speaker professor a rajamani from madurai he will be talking on cytokine inhibitors and his final surgical intervention dr rajamani <clears throat> being to all first of all thank you for uh, making my presence here at this odd time i am taking in the fisher role for want of time is it working yes and my talk from the previous speakers has made my job easy so that uh, i can say today going to the topic and everybody all of us know that medical or surgical treatment does not cure the disease so the aim is to reduce the pain and halt the damage so the goal is to control symptoms and to prevent further damage and correct deformities medical treatment as you all know the dmrd is and the next what is currently is uses other drugs which fight against certain immune cells either reduce immune mediators or block immune cell functions and the medical treatment of all these things they do not work when the first line of the dmrd do not work we are going for a second line of drug that is biologics and always try to choose a less potent drug first because if medically suppressing the immune system too drastically can cause to stop other fighting infections bubble infections or other infections in that way treatment has to be individualized and the response vary from one to another individual because of the gut microbiomes which has been already discussed elaborately by the previous speakers because there are certain bacteria which convert the fibers into the short chain regulate cells to suppress the inflammation at the same time there are other bacteria hinder high drug absorption to the state which delay the absorption so that treatment varies from individual to individual so to basically to start with cyto means cells the kinos means movements it is basically a low molecular weight proteins a glycoproteins which has got a significant role in induction and regulation of cell immune system it is an important role in inflammatory response and as well the hematopoiesis it is basically involved in the cell to cell communication in a coordinated immune response it has got a very good role in both innate and adaptive immune response the modality of action of cytotoxic inhibitors are either the synthesis of cytosines is production is minimized or the available active form is reduced or there is a receptor block or there is a signaling of the cytosine receptor is intervened in the genetic modulation inside the cell now we take a few drugs of the reduction in cytos cytokine synthesis as for all you know azathioprine and methotrexate as immunosuppressants as well as anti inflammatory agents the mycophenolate is the one which is a monoclonal antibody mainly suppress the lipocyte population by the complex lysis then there are other group drug which is a glucocorticoid which we know before we commit act as put into it the cytokine inhibitors anti inflammatory which as well keep the cells viable but it reduces the cytokine formation by inhibiting the interleukin 1 and tumor necrosis factor in this way the glucocorticoids act as a cytokine inhibitor also now coming to the other group of drugs which is uh, reducing the cytokine active forms which is a monoclonal antibody inclusive marks which have already been very well discussed which act with the antigen binding parts of the tumor necrosis factor which acts with the basis of the igg molecule and currently the another soluble receptors are used which is also a monoclonal antibody but it acts with the gene technology the non antigen binding parts of the igg molecule receptor of the tumor necrosis factor now there are certain drugs dexcelimab and dexcelimab which acts on the target inhibiting the cytosine receptors 
there by antibodies against intruder activity and then the <coughs> blocking receptors for the central T lymphocytes, which is suppressed with cellular immune reactions. Then the last one, which is currently on the go, is uh, even tried in the, the AIDS, that is Rolimus, it's a rapamycin, which intracellularly acts, the genetic signaling is stopped. It's a blockage inside the cell. So in all these four ways, the cytotoxin inhibitors are used, which of course, as an operating surgeon, I do not have much experience of this. I have just exhibited my knowledge in what a surgeon has to know about these drugs. Please can be asked with my rheumatology colleagues. So now we come to the second part of the, my talk, that is surgical spinal intervention. As already covered by my previous speaker, Naresh, Basically, there are serious situations which is primarily indicated in the spine. One is instability, which is causing pain. Another one is political deformity. Another one is a neurological deficit. These things can be very well treated by osteotomies, a decompression, and instrumentation and infusion. But these patients they have a caution about before doing surgery. That is because most of the patients have a long-time steroids, which produce an osteoporosis which gives a problem of stabilization and achieving fusion. And the prolonged steroids can do a delayed healing, both for fusion and wound infection following surgeries. And other joint involvements, hip and knee, have a delay in rehabilitation process. And one should have a caution about this. Before surgical intervention, we, we have to restore the cardiorespiratory surgery. Think about it, because mainly this is a problem of surgery per se by the anesthetists but for an immediate post-operative period because of the deformities. Positioning, already mentioned earlier, is very difficult in certain cases. The grass kyphosis with the lectensis involved is very difficult to position the patient. And as well, it gives a problem for intubation to the anesthetists, which have been very well described earlier. And once again, why to stop these all biologics before surgery? The preparation of surgery is also influenced two to three weeks prior to surgery, you have to stop that, and then we have to restart it. So in these situations, following surgery, you anticipate new infection and treat accordingly. And above all, in spite of a bone formation is there in ankylosing spondylitis, we may have a problem of osteoporosis and stabilization of the fractures. And this is a real situation where it is a grass kyphosis, Cardiorespiratory cell is there, patient is not able to see straight because of the head is uh, totally chin to the chest deformity and the totally the posture is to be corrected by various varieties of osteotomy we have got. But basically we do a medical subtraction osteotomy and smith Peterson osteotomy, you have to be very careful in doing all these types of osteotomies have a neuro monitoring center which is possible. And nowadays we have got a lot of gadgets like uh, navigation and all so that we are able to safely do the corrections of this surgery very easily. Next is a deformity in the sagittal balance, a flat back and a pain in the back. That we correct by the, all these intervening discs, the spaces, and then the pelvis on all these equipments are available nowadays to correct the flat back like this. And then, not only this hip and knee involvement, which as I told you earlier, which has to be treated simultaneously, depending upon the priority of the problem. You have to give weightage whether you have to correct the spine and hip, and both has to be attended with way of the replacement. And it's a progressive disease. One, one surgery is not enough because it's a progressive disease over a period of time. You may have to do the repeated surgery second time again in another region, maybe in a cervical or maybe the joints, something like that. So we have to very well inform the patient before venturing surgery on this. And this is a situation, another situation where a trivial injury can go in for a fracture, which uh, uh, because the whole spinal column, both proximal and distal to the fracture, moves entirely in a single column. And the neurological deficit comes in easily in these situations. And the stabilization procedure is a must in these situations to avoid the neurological problems. And then the patient is pain free. And then one more thing I like to, for completion's sake, in the upper cervical spine, commonly the cord compression happens by the inflammatory tissue 
or as well the damage of the sebum so that at all the oxygen dislocation happens in the upper cervical spine which is a life threatening issue and in those days we like to do a simple procedure of the group sebum c2 and if the situation warrants the more damage is there probably we have done the uh, some cases of occipital cervical fusion compromising the atrial oxygen joint movement and then the patient can never say yes or no in their right time but nowadays the more and more gadgets are available we save the occipital cervical movements and then we see the lateral mass of this medical screws we have got it and then so we save the occipital cervical <clears throat> movements and achieve a stabilization with the decompression so the neurological part of is taken care of and so to conclude because i want to finish in time i want to be point it is not no cure for the disease basically and the aim is to reduce pain and hard joint product take down mm. control of symptoms and prevent further damages we have to realize it is a lifelong issue with relaxing and banning and we have to make the patient functionally comfortable and the treatment has to be individualized with the basic of nih demart and biology inhibitors coming to the surgical intervention part of it cannot cure the disease pain and deformity in neurology has to be addressed surgically and technical difficulties intubation positioning preparing the patient with prior to surgery when to stop the drugs when to restart the drugs after the surgery all these things has to be taken into care of because you have to take care of patients and then the long run avoid infections of the surgical ward and the reasons vary depending upon the individual profile disease status and other joint involvement for hip and knee for the purpose of rehabilitation and surgery has got a definite role in the previous indications by way of osteotomies decompression and stabilization and repeated surgery is necessary in all these patients because it is a progressive disease spanning for the lifetime thank you so much once again for giving me the opportunity to share my experience with you and all thank you thank you sir thank you for a great lecture so now the next speaker was professor santanu lakar from dibrugarh but just few minutes ago i got a message from dr lakar that uh, he has stuck somewhere and could not join today so uh, that uh, we missed his lecture but uh, sir has assured that in uh, in future he will be very much with us so anyway then we move on to the next lecture so with great honor again i uh, i invite uh, another legendary figure of uh, this evening professor s s jha from patna sir is not only a great teacher but mentor and guide uh, for us as far as ortho rheumatology is concerned so sir will be talking on biologics in special situations professor jha sir uh, professor rajamani yeah. uh, stop sharing stop sharing the screen yeah. R- right now i share this screen and in the meantime i am not talking on biologics in special situations i will be talking about guidelines uh, that uh, has been framed uh, for iora and ioa so let's talk about guidelines this is nothing but a final briefing on the management protocol starting from the very beginning friends spondyloarthritis guideline 1 i have made 11 guidelines for our association so from history you have to suspect that it may be a case of spondyloarthropathy in a patient who is coming 3 or more months complaining of chronic back pain and age of onset is less than 45 years you have to requisition mri of the sacroiliac joint and hla b27 number 2 ascertain and classify whether it is axial spondyloarthritis or 
peripheral spondyloarthritis. Number three, you have to determine whether the disease is active or stable. Active is a axial disease and symptoms are at an acceptably bothersome level. Inflammatory status has to be just as per clinician's examination. Stable ankylosing will be either asymptomatic disease or the symptoms are there at an acceptable level and clinically it becomes stable only after minimum six months of treatment is required. Number four, first line therapy is, remember everybody has said, NSAID, continuous two NSAID for four weeks. It could be first for one and then second for three or first for two and second for two, two weeks. There are no preferred NSAID. It could be one of your choice. No systemic glucocorticoid is recommended to be administered. Peripheral arthritis, you can use sulfasalazine over methotrexate. Now the first line therapy, if there is confinement to the two peripheral joints or less than two, you can here go for local glucocorticoid infiltration, like in sacroiliac joint, but avoid enthesitis areas like Achilles, patellar, and cordyceps areas. Physiotherapy is a must, as has already been overemphasized. Number five, active ankylosing of spondylitis, still despite NSAID. So now comes the role of second line therapy. And in second line, the first choice is TNF alpha inhibitors. No preference. Second choice is secukinumab or exejumab. And third choice is the latest tofacitinib, the small molecule. But if for a patient of ankylosing spondylitis with inflammatory bowel disease or uveitis, you prefer the monoclonal antibodies, infliximab, adalimumab, sertolizumab, golimumab over other biologics. Number six, I say stop, look, and go. Maybe by now your patient has not got the proper relief. So wait, further investigate, and here is again a time where you can repeat a spinal or pelvis MRI. Guideline number seven, active disease and is not responding. So now comes the role of third line therapy. First degree non-responder despite TNF-alpha inhibitor. So first strong choice will be secukinumab or exezumab. Second choice could be tofacitinib. Second degree non-responder despite TNF-alpha, you can change to alternative TNF-alpha. Friends, we must be against non-TNF-alpha and non-secukinumab, exejumab therapy, and also should not add sulfasalazine or methotrexate for this region. Number eight, now come to the stable cases. Physical therapy, yes. Is stable ankylosing on biologic, do not discontinue the drug, but taper the biologic. NSAID on demand. Is stable on TNF-alpha inhibitor and NSAID. Now you can stop NSAID. Is stable ankylosing spondylitis on TNF-alpha? Oral targeted synthetic DMARD, that is tofacitinib. Continue TNF-alpha inhibitor alone and stop targeted synthetic DMARD. We must take a note that original, originator TNF-alpha inhibitor do not switch over to a biosimilar from other company. Guideline number one, you have to monitor the patient as has already been enumerated by DAS-CRP or DAS-ESR scores. 
avoid using treat to target strategy and avoid repeated spine radiographs at scheduled intervals. Avoid obtaining spinal or pelvis MRI to confirm inactivity. Guideline number 10, arthritis might require a joint replacement. Severe kyph kyphosis in expert hands, go for a spinal osteotomy. Otherwise, if there are no spinal centers, avoid. Osteoporosis, spinal fusion uh, could be recommended, but do not ever go for spinal manipulation. And guideline number one for our country, we recommend using traditional DMARDs from the very beginning in higher doses or following biological therapy whenever cost becomes a constraint. Like for example, sulfasalazine, even otherwise, has potent anti-inflammatory effect similar to biologics, also antibacterial and immunomodulator properties. If it is a case of psoriatic arthritis, higher doses of methotrexate are more effective and results are comparable to rheumatoid arthritis. Remission could be achieved in 20% of psoriatic arthritis. So friends, with these 11 recommendations, you can limit your diagnosis and management. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for giving a clear picture about managing the spondyloarthropathy. Now we have, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are very much audible. Thank you. Ah, okay. Okay, okay, okay. So now we have come to almost an end of uh, the program and uh, 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 and and uh, I'd like to call upon a man who was behind the entire program, a dynamic person, the convener of the IOA Spine Subcommittee of IOA, uh, Professor Partha Sarthi Sarkar, to uh, uh, for giving a conclusive remark. But I think before he put on conclusive remark. Shall we take one or two questions, sir? Because I can see one question in the chat box. Sure, go ahead. So one question for Dr. Ravi Gupta. Uh, Dr. Soham Ghosh is asking that how often do you prescribe MRI uh, in orthopedic OPD uh, the, in cases of uh, uh, non-specific back pain? See, firstly, clinically, we need to ascertain whether it is inflammatory backache or it is mechanical backache. And then you should have at least backache continuously for the last three months. So in those cases, I will be having very low threshold to get the MRI. Right. And what again becomes important that you have rightly said, that the duration of <clears throat> symptoms. Suppose a very frank, uh, uh, you can open the back and look at it and come to a conclusion that this is nothing but not only spondyloarthritis has come into the stage of ankylosing spondylitis. So first get an MRI and as Dr. Amarnath was saying, sacroiliac joints are to be seen and for better visibility of sacroiliac joints, it is the posterior anterior uh, view of the pelvis in which the sacroiliac joint becomes very visible. It could be oblique view as well. But as far as the recommendations are concerned, if it is a very short duration, you have to ask for this MRI because it will be in this pre-radiological stage that you will not miss the diagnosis. The marrow edema, the erosions are, can only be seen in MRI and that is why 
MRI should be recommended if you have suspected it. And not only MRI, HLA B27 also is a costlier investigation. This also must be asked for. Okay. And I think question. the more important thing yes, is yes. we must ascertain that the symptoms are present consistently of the inflammatory backache for at least three months. That is the recommendation. So what happens is in our day-to-day -day OPDs, we see a lot of patients of low backache who are, you know, kind of stressful working and atmospheres. If you look at the causes of backache, the 60% causes of backache can be related to psychogenic. So in those cases, the backache will be not so consistent and inflammatory. That may be a kind of, you know, intermittent and then the consistently after rest, the pain will not be there. And, you know, uh, that is important. Then you go for MRI. And always okay. look for associated <clears throat> features like enthesitis and other involvement. The, the history itself that the patient is worse in the morning and improves with activity. Okay. So I can see three, four more questions, but I think because of the time constraint, we will take one more. The second question, someone is asking that how to decide the use of uh, biologics, particularly between the TNF alpha blocker and interleukin-17 inhibitors. Yes. Uh, you have to also look into the economic uh, background of the patient. That also becomes very important. And as I have graded various guidelines, this, uh, uh, this is not a first line therapy. This is not second line therapy. And also third, this is second and third line therapy both. So you should not quickly jump to secukinumab you can start with infliximab. And in my own experience, I have found that etanercept is equally good. And presently what I find that the FDA has recommended use of tofacitinib in seronegative spondyloarthropathy. So infliximab, even um, uh, the other etanercept can be used and you can keep secukinumab as reserve. Okay. Only advantage with secukinumab is that uh, the progression of the disease is said to be halted. But then it has to be uh, used for maybe very many years. Four years studies are there. Okay. So thank you, sir. And now at the Sanjay, end. Sanjay, yes, just sorry yes, to interrupt. Okay. The doctor okay, Jha was mentioning about it. Just want to add on a couple of things on the financials. Okay, okay, now, okay. Dr. Jha, thank you for bringing the financials because today, after being in the insurance segment for almost 12 years, now I can tell you this treatment can be given in certain uh, medical policies up to eight months in a year. Up to eight months in a year. Some companies give you six months. But if you have any challenges, if any of you have challenges, just message me. I will guide you through how to go about it. Thank you. Thank you. Right. That will be a good step. Thank you, sir. Can, can, I, can I just add a small thing for our general orthopedic surgeons? Yes. I will say that don't just venture to give biologicals as the medical representative is coming to us and telling us that this is the drug you know, which you can give. It requires a lot of experience. It is a double-edged weapon which can have systemic implications. So I would say if you want to start, be in touch with an expert and then try to follow the advice or maybe you can work as a member of a team with the rheumatologist and then you slowly and slowly go into that path. So that's my advice to all youngsters. I always keep on saying be, become a master of the basic NSAID the conventional synthetic. Unfortunately, sulfur salazin still has some role, but others do not. But do not forget leflunomide. That also is uh, expected to give good results. 
Okay, thank you, sir. So I think Dr. Arthi and Dr. Arnab, can you say any other other question in chat box? I don't think so, but uh, all the th I think so. All the areas have been cleared regarding the financial constraints and uh, regarding the treatments Dr. Jha has um, uh, uh, like uh, told to us about and Dr. Ravi, the current concepts. So I think so we need much more lectures to clear this because this is a very vast subject and the new upcoming subject. And uh, I think now we can conclude and uh, I'll now request, I think so, Dr. Parth, Dr. Path, are you? Yes, yes, yes. Thank Doctor? you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. No, no. I, I thought Dr. Raja has to say something. Okay. Raja? Yes, sir. We already discussed the basic pathogenesis. So, any young patient with inflammatory back pain with enthesite is always suspect um, uh, spondyloarthritis and MRI is, good at, is a good tool. And uh, once you understand the pathology, we can uh, go for... Uh, other biologics which are very helpful uh, these days in uh, treating and controlling the symptoms. So one need to be uh, aware of the pathology and uh, as we already discussed, you should know when, uh, which uh, drug to use and when. So it will be helpful for our patients. Okay. Thank you. So, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I am very much grateful to our parent organization, Indian Orthopedic Association, for giving me the opportunity. And I also thank our senior teacher, our mentor, Professor S.S. Jhasar, for helping me to make this one conclusive note. The seronegative spondyloarthropathy or axial spondyloarthritis has sacroiliitis and enthesitis as a hallmark of the disease. MRI of the pelvis is preferred imaging modality for identifying the osteitis of sacroiliac joints. And B HLA B27 is another milestone investigation. Axial spondyloarthrosis is a chronic systemic inflammatory disease affecting the sacroiliac joints, spine, and occasionally peripheral joints. The sacroiliac ileitis evident on pain radiograph is characteristics of ankylosing spondylitis but it is more advanced presentation of the disease. However, it typically takes five to 10 years from the onset of the inflammatory back pain until the development of the definite radiographic sacroiliitis. But there are patients now called non-radiographic axial spondyloarthropathy, in which it does not progress over time to definite radiographic changes. The assessment of spondyloarthritis, International Society, ASS classification criteria have been developed for patients with back pain greater than three months and age of onset less than 45 years in order to identify the early disease. A clinician has to be aware of early clinical presentation of enthesitis and should proceed to further investigate so that early diagnosis is not missed and treatment is instituted. Unlike rheumatoid arthritis, axialos arthropathy does not respond to all conventional synthetic TMRDs. While TNF-alpha and interleukin 17 are very effective in both spinal and peripheral joints, we have to train ourselves in instituting such therapeutic measures by regularly involving this kind of scientific activities by IOA and Indian Orthopedic Rheumatology Association. And I must thank our course in charge, Professor Sanjay Keskar and wonderful moderator by Dr. Arnup Parmukar and Dr. Arti Divan. And I must thank Professor S.S. Jha sir for the whole concept and Professor Manish Khanna sir for the whole heart support and also our esteemed faculty, faculties, Professor A.K. Pal, Dr. S.S. Amarnath, and our chairman, Dr. Nadesh Babu, Dr. Ravi Gupta, Dr. D. Raja, and Dr. Abhay Essence, and my teacher, Professor Vipla Acharya, Professor A.S. Rajamani, and above all, our president, Ramesh Sen, sir, for his encouraging word. And with that, 
I uh, want to say, I want to share my experience of our chairman, Dr. Naresh Babu. Sir, please conclude no, the session. It's an excellent Your program, Bharata. No need to, nothing to add. It's a wonderful program. We had a, many more things to pick up and learn in spite of, uh, though we deal with so many Swanaradhyapathis, uh, the knowledge what we have gained is definitely going to help us in a in daily routine. Thank you very much for all the student faculty and uh, Indian Dubrological Association for taking the initiative and being a part of uh, our spine program. Thank you all. So, sir, before ending, I think <clears throat> there is a proposal from Professor A.K. Paul that uh, in uh, near future we have to, again, you give us a chance so that we can hold a... Uh, uh, an academic program related to surgical aspect because so, so, this, this time we have not covered much because of scarcity of time. Two lectures were there as far as surgery is concerned, but uh, could not cover it in uh, this thing. So uh, I request the IOA Spine Subcommittee to give us a chance, another chance. We, after three to four weeks, uh, please give us a chance to hold another session, particularly on surgical aspect. It, it, uh, all the, it's all our pleasure. I think Pardo has already planned for five okay. more. So that's what he has been doing. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. He'll Thank be you, in sir. Touch with you and then uh, we can have it. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. We okay. will continue. We will continue, sir. Okay, thank so, you so much, so sir. Thank, thank you so much, sir, for your whole support. Added support. Thank you all. So, thank you all. And uh, I, uh, I, I think that uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Jha uh, sir and Manish Khanna sir, uh, if, they are, if they have any experience or sir, please share your experience regarding this, then you can, it will be complete, I think so. Uh, sir, I, 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 think, I think you have planned it so well. You deserve all praise, the whole team. And uh, the I am happy that we have been able to coordinate with the IOS spine uh, subcommittee. I, I myself belong to the uh, rheumatology subcommittee of IOA. So a great coordination and thank you everybody. And I was happy to see Professor Biplab uh, and uh, was very happy to hear his words. Uh, Dr. Pal, he, he has come back. Yes. Have you come back, Dr. Pal? Yes, sir. Actually, I was there. Actually, I was traveling and I'm oh, requesting yes, all yes, to yes. make another so, uh, but program under the, on under surgical the, tidbits. Right. Under the constraints, it has been well planned. And I must express Definitely. that all the master trainers who were here had very, very smart presentation. Thank you, all the master trainers also. And uh, Dr. Dilip is, uh, has left. Professor Dilip? Oh, sir, sir, sorry, sir, Dilip, sir. Dilip, sir, is a man, mentor, man, really, man, he was so much active in this uh, total program. He has not been able to have any lecture, but he is so involved that some man, before the pro program started. Sir, please share your experience, sir. Dilip, sir. Sorry, sir. I think he is not. Dilip has left. Dilip has no, left. No, he... Oh, oh, sorry. Okay, 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 sir. Okay, sir. Okay, right. Okay, so you can end it on a happy note that all was really and, uh, well. Sir, fortunately, we have Dr. Arti. She is the probably she is the only lady orthopedic surgeon uh, who, interested. Uh, who is interested in his spine because most of our lady orthopedic surgeons, they are interested in pediatric orthopedics. So we are very fortunate and uh, really we are happy that Dr. Arti is with us. She has been calling from the very big morning. Right. Okay. So, so, so let's so let's conclude the session, sir. And uh, you can do uh, so. Good night to everyone. Good night. Good night. And, uh, I think Manish also is not there. Manish, are you there? No, no. So it's already twenty-five past ten, but still yes, we have. Sir more than 20 participants once upon a time it was touching 40 Papa. participants so okay. so thank you all for most important is that it is recorded so anybody can look into it anytime right, right. one like so dr dilip has come back
Okay, Doctor Dilip. Doctor Dilip. Unmute, sir. Yes, sir. Is there, sir? Did you know, sir? Please share your experience, sir, regarding this webinar. Yeah. Okay. Ah. This is a very good, uh, a very good seminar com comprising of uh, almost all the uh, spheres of this Pandalo Arthapathy. And uh, the way of 11 points that you told are really uh, as a, is a landmark, you know. The 11 points to take, the IUA guidelines and the rheumatology guidelines that you told. Professor Jha, I'm talking to you. Right. Yeah, it is actually has got a great meaning and it is actually helpful for all our treating doctors. This is number one. Number two, this uh, Ravi uh, from uh, Chandigarh, I think. He is in Chandigarh, yes. No, yes, 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 yes. Government yes. Medical College, Chandigarh. No, no, no. He, he, he has shifted oh, yes, to 40s. Right. Uh, yeah. He has shifted to 40s, sir. Earlier, he was in government hospital, Chandigarh. Oh, I see. Now, now he has he, resigned and he has shifted to 40s hospital, Mohali. 40s hospital. Uh, that is in Chandigarh. Uh, yeah, Mohali. yeah, Mohali, Chandigarh, yeah. Right. Yeah, so he has uh, told, uh, he has actually has got a very, uh, uh, very concise and beautiful wisdom of uh, presentation that I observed. Only it can be it can be possible from a mature person that he has told us about that thing. So that I am happy with that. Third thing is regarding the this arthroplasty in in yeah. your uh, spondyl arthropathy. Yes, it is actually uh, the I we we it is the last resort to the replacement of the joint that is there. Avanath has got a very good uh, uh, proposition and he has given us our. Uh, a boost for our this financial uh, health uh, so that the insurance company can help us for eight months. Then actually it is either it is eight months or six months. I think it is six months. Isn't it? Uh, uh, so, so, yeah. yeah I, I think we'll definitely discuss further but yes, there yeah. are certain companies which give you eight months. There are certain companies which give you three. You will get a chance to from three okay, to eight okay. months. I would say, depending we'll on the formulate. company. We will take help from you. Don't worry. And uh, lastly, as uh, yeah, our uh, Keskar, uh, I must thank Keskar because he has coordinated well, and he has also asked that because of the limitations of time, he has actually only took up to one or two questions or so three questions like that. So the cleverly he has managed everything. And uh, the organizer, among all the organizers, I must thank everybody, uh, including that uh, convener and uh, our, our uh, this Partho. Partho has done a wonderful job in finding out people who are sleeping for long years. People who are sleeping for long years, and he has awakened them and activated them to come to and open their mouth in the forum. So thank you, thank you very much. And I appreciate uh, the endeavor and uh, everybody, everybody knows uh, this IOA, people they know very well that what <laughs> this subspecialty is doing uh, for several years. So Amarna, thank you very much. Uh, we will see you, yeah. Namaste, Jha sahab, namaste. Bye, bye. Uh, bye, bye. Thank you. So let Keskar wind it up. Keskar. Yeah, Kes Keskar is there till the end. Amarnath, you have a dual role. You are visible twice. No, no, I must. Bipla Vajari is there. I told that people were I were ending for a long time, and he has, now okay. the actually it is Partho who has brought them into the oblivion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. And uh, uh, Nares Babu has got a very good background that I observed today. <laughs> the background of your uh, setup is very nice. Very good presentation. He had. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. And uh, yeah. So, Keskar, we actually we have to end close. with the smile of our Keskar. You know? Keskar, close but it now. Somebody else. Keskar is. 
yes sir yes sir so yeah so as you said we are now. closing it sir so right. thank you all okay right. thank you sir thank you right. good night right. sir good night everyone good, good night, night good night good night, good night. Okay, good night to nigga thank you partho thank you thank you keskar and now keskar is busy for the this mci isn't it <laughs>